Hey, it's Tim here. We're back doing more Snowflake. Uh, we're going to be pushing on. This is the third video in a series where I'm essentially just going through the getting started guide that Snowflake have on their website. Um, essentially, we finished off at the fifth step last time, loading data. So we essentially managed to load data from S3 into our Snowflake environment. And so today we're going to be pushing on. Uh, we're probably going to be looking at some more of the analytical queries and also trying to look at some of the account administration aspects. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. This is a long video. Um, if you look at the timestamps below, you'll sort of get a gauge of what's coming up and what you might be interested in. Um, so yeah, let's get stuck in. Let's not waste any time and let's start doing this. Okay, so last time we finished this step of loading data, you can see here, uh, we basically went through this entire step and we got pretty much to the end. We had a couple of issues, uh, most notably, uh, specifically when it came to uh, making sure that we had the right um, column types and making sure that the CSV files that we were loading from S3 were actually being ingested properly. We managed to get around that using um, the SQL that was actually in the worksheet. So this worksheet is available to you when you start off the, uh, the demo. Uh, there's a little bug here where you can see that I've loaded it up, but it's not actually sort of loading it. And now when we go out and come back in, it works. So um, that's something to be aware of. So basically, yes, you can see here that the last thing we did was we just essentially copied everything from, uh, uh, well, we copied into trips from city city bike trips, if that makes sense. OK, so we can see here the file format was CSV. So now that we've done that, the next thing to do is to carry on to module five, uh, which is actually module six. And at this point in this demo, all they're trying to do is get you to use Snowflake as a database. So for those of you who've used Tableau, this is normally the kind of stuff you'd use uh, Tableau for. You wouldn't be using SQL. You'd be doing it nicely in Tableau desktop. OK, so um, essentially, this is a very simple part of the process. Now, I've already got Snowflake running over here, so we don't need to sort of worry too much about that. Uh, what we will be doing sometimes is just simply highlighting the query and then hitting run just to save time for the video. Um, but we will try and sort of decipher some of the queries and see how they're working. I'm not a SQL expert, so um, I'll just be sort of trying to give my basic understanding of this. But as you know, this is a video where I'm learning and you're kind of learning with me. So hopefully that helps. OK, so, yeah, let's go back to the step six and let's just uh, sort of figure our way around this. And um, one of the key things to note about this step and actually many of the steps going forward is that Snowflake is trying to sort of introduce the philosophy of how they work. OK, and so um, there'll be sort of a lot of things here that seem simple, but actually they're kind of trying to get you to sort of see the difference between this and the traditional relational database, as it were. OK, so uh, some of these points might be a bit labored, but I think they're really useful ones to sort of go through. So let's work through this. So let's see this. Um, everything they highlight in yellow is always useful to read. So I will skip right to that. A real world roles and queries. Um, within a real company, analytics users would likely have a different role than sys admin. Essentially, not everyone's an administrator. Um, to keep the lab simple, we're going to stay with the sys admin role for this section. Additionally, querying would typically be done with a business intelligence product like Tableau. Hey, hey, hey! Uh, Looker, Power BI, and so on and so forth. In my in my view, that's 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 in the right order. Okay. <laughs> For more advanced analytics, data science tools like Data Robot, Data Coup, AWS SageMaker, or many others could query Snowflake essentially. So if you need more sort of hands-on uh, tools, then you've already got those capabilities for you there. Any technology that leverages JDBC slash ODBC, these are database connectors. So uh, JDBC, I think it just stands for Java Database Connector or something like that. And ODBC is Open Database Connector or something like that. Okay. Uh, Spark or Python can run analytics on the data in Snowflake. To keep this lab simple, all queries are being done via Snowflake Worksheet. So essentially what they're saying is, listen, in the real world, you wouldn't use the Snowflake interface and you'd probably use actual tools to do this. So like, you know, this is this is just us showing you how it works. But in the real world, you'll probably be using something a bit more organic, like a tool, because you're likely trying to do something to your data. OK, so that's a good context to know. Like um, a lot of people will sort of hear databases and they'll immediately see SQL and they'll think that everyone in the world writes SQL. Actually, no, you use tools that typically do the SQL for you or you use tools that help compile the SQL, but then you run the bits that you want and the bits you don't want. OK, so execute the select statements and result cache. So essentially, this one is going to be trying to get us to see the cache in action. So run the query below to see a sample of the trips data. So let's go back and you see here that it's actually got um, everything set up now. It's going to make sure that we're using this specific role. So let's just make sure we're using that role. So role is sysadmin, uh, warehouse is analytical warehouse. In my case, I'm going to stick to compute. 
Uh, then you've got use database city bike and uh, use schema public. So everything is pretty much where we left it off last time. Okay, so let's go ahead and just select this line and hit run and then see what we get back. It's going to ask this. I'm going to keep uh, sort of not uh, ticking this box because I think I want people to see this every single time. So they're clear that I'm actually running the query. So when we go ahead and run that query, it took a bit of time because, of course, my Snowflake instance was asleep. The warehouse wasn't running. Now it's running. Everything is good to go. So we can see here we get a sample of the data and we're pretty much good to go. Everything's worked exactly as expected. OK, so we get pretty much the same data. It might be slightly different given, you know, where where everything is and how everything is, is done. But essentially, we get the, the sample data. First, let's look at some basic hourly statistics on city bike usage. OK, so we've downloaded some data from S3. Now we want to start analyzing it and see how our bikes used um, run the query below in the worksheet. It will show for each hour the number of trips, average trip duration and average trip distance. So let's go ahead and uh, go back. I, I think actually my dog is snoring in the background. One sec. OK, buddy. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> I had to wake him up slowly just to so stop snoring. Um, <laughs> maybe it's as boring as, as my dog thinks it is. I hope not. If, if that's the case, let me know in the comments below. So um, let's go back here and just select a few uh, of these lines. So this is the step we're trying to do here. So let's just look at this query in more detail. Let me just give this more space. Hang on. Let me see if I can drag this down. There you go. Blue marker down. And if I just hit Command Plus, I think this will zoom in. There we go. So select basically uh it's basically taking the start time and it wants us to take the hour uh it's truncating to the hour and just bring it back as a date so basically uh, select the trip time uh, round it up to the hour and just bring it back as a date essentially the the trip time is actually like a, a date time and in, uh, interface so um by truncating to the hour we just return everything within the hour to have the same uh, start time and then the date we just bring in as a date essentially so that will give the column name date essentially okay and then count the number of trips, basically count everything and return it as number of trips. And then the average trip duration. So essentially the trip duration is in seconds divided by 60 will give us the minutes. Uh, and so uh, if we do that and then take the average of that, um, then essentially uh, we'll get the average duration in minutes. So they've done it slightly different here. They've taken sort of the trip time created an average in seconds, then divided it by 60. You could do the same thing, essentially. Then you get the answer in minutes. It will be decimal point minutes, but essentially it will still be uh, fine. OK, then the average um, uh, start latitude, uh, the start station longitude and station. OK, cool. So what it's basically doing um, is it's using a special function. So have a sign i think is a is a specific um, spatial function or specific function that will allow us if i just scroll across so we can see the rest of this query and see if i can i can't really i can bring this to the left so if we just look at this um it's basically going to be calculating the distance so this is like a big clue of what's going on and i think this function is like a is like a mathematical function that essentially takes a start point uh the finish point and it takes those two things and it calculates the distance. I don't know how it does it because it's not like um, the journey time. It's just basically drawing a line between the two. I don't believe it's doing anything sort of complex, uh, like, you know, plotting the routes. To do that, you'd need an API to go out to, let's say something like a mapping database so you can get something back, okay? Uh, so it's just calculating the distance as the bird flies, essentially. And it's doing that from trips um, and a group by one, order by one, essentially. So just give it, give it, give it some sense of order. So let's go ahead and highlight that and hit run. And let's hit run again. And uh, we'll sort of bring this up. And there you go. You get basically uh, for each hour, the number of trips, the average duration, the average distance. And because it's aggregating this, we don't get sort of the locations. Just taking a look how many trips are happening in a particular time and what's the average distance and average duration. So we can sort of look at all the different start times of our journey by hour and see, OK, how many trips are being made and what's the average sort of picture look like in this sense. It's a very generalized way of doing this. Once you start doing more analytical questions, you might want to do some more sort of bespoke queries. So that's that query done.
done. Essentially, we just select that, we run it, and then you're able to just uh, look at it. Now, if I go ahead and look at the query ID and I just go into the query by clicking on it, you actually go to this uh, sort of view where it shows you the query again. So you can see it's a success. You can see the query ID itself and you can see the query that run. And one thing you can do is you can actually profile the query. So if I just uh, zoom back out, you can actually sort of see the profile of the query. Essentially, it's showing you sort of what was happening, okay? So if I just click on this, um, if I just show you this little square marker here, it makes sure that everything is sort of in the screen. And um, it, it sort of shows you like, you know, what cost you the most, you know, what was, what was the most expensive part of this process? And so you can see here the table scan, uh, was uh, you know took 72% of sort of the total cost. I never know how to sort of interpret this because it, it's sort of like costs in Snowflake are based on credit systems. So it's it doesn't sort of give you a monetary value, but it's essentially just showing you, look, this query, um, most of your effort was spent down here. And then look, some of these other things uh, took a lot less time. So this is our sort of whole query. We go to 61 million rows, we aggregate it, we sort it, and then we return the result. And that's what we see inside of the query window and you can actually see some of that um, uh, sort of performance uh, over here on the right hand side broken down by various factors again this is probably worth another video so i'll probably do another video on uh, you know breaking down the profile of a query in snowflake or something like that i keep taking notes by the way on the side making sure i take all these things down because they're not things i understand and it's probably worth coming back to them uh, but if we go back then we just go back in this sort of window and it takes us back to our initial query that we ran and we can just sort of expand this out. So that's that's basically that. I just wanted to sort of give a deep dive into what one query looks like so you can understand sort of the mechanics of how this is all working and how it's all are coming together, okay? So let's go back to our query. Um, and this is the query we've looked at. We've got a result. Um, and basically the point here is that Snowflake has a result cache that holds the results of every query executed in the past 24 hours. These are available across warehouses. So essentially, it doesn't matter how many warehouses you are, you have, whether a small warehouse did the job or a large warehouse did the job, the cache is universal to all of those warehouses, okay? So query results returned to one user are available to any other user on the system who executes the same query. So it's got like a global awareness of queries being asked. So if someone, uh, let's say, run a query on a super fast data uh, warehouse, sorry, and then I come along with my small warehouse and ask the same question, I'll benefit from the fact that the question's already been answered by a more powerful warehouse. So that's a nice way of saving costs as well. It's really trying to optimize the amount of use you get out of this. Um, query sort of hits don't, don't cost you anything because there's, an, there's already an answer there, so why why would I why would I need to ask the same question again? And that cache uh, here is executed over 24 hours. I'm not sure if you can change that period. It'll probably cost more to keep that cache available for longer, uh, but um, it's nice that any query asked in the last 24 hours. Um, are going to be available, which means that data is kept fresh. Data is, um, you know, you don't have anything that's sort of over a, over a day. But the other key thing is it's also interesting to understand whether this is sort of automatically invalidated once you load new data into it. So does it have an awareness of, oh, I've had new data, so let me not rely on the query. I'm sure that's probably uh, the case. Maybe that will get explained in a bit, but let's push on. Not only do these uh, repeated queries return extremely fast, but they also use no compute credit, so you don't get charged for them, essentially. Let's see the result cache in action by running the exact same query again. So let's go back, and you'll see here that they don't actually uh, give us the query again, so we're just going to literally do the same thing, highlight it, and run it again. And it's going to ask us again, and we're going to hit run. And you'll see that this one returned in 65 milliseconds, okay? So if we go to the query ID and we go to it, You'll see the query profile uh, view that we ran earlier on. Now, uh, it looks completely different. And you can see that because for a brief moment, you saw uh, what we, what it looked like. In fact, what I'll do is I'll probably take a screenshot of that and overimpose it and fade in between the two of them in, in, in post. But you can see this one just use the cache. So it basically is a query reuse and return the answer straight away. The other way I can show you that, if I go to the history tab, uh, I've only run two queries, uh, essentially, so they were immediately after each other. And you can see here they are. So these are basically the exact same query. So here's the second one that I ran, and that's a, a SQL. And then here's the first one that I ran, exactly the same. And uh, just, just to sort of keep this easy for you to see, let me just highlight those two queries. Uh, so here are the two queries. 
you can see they're both done in the Snowflake UI. And the key thing you want to sort of pay attention to is the total duration. So the first time it ran, it took 2.1 seconds, not like a slow uh, response at all. But the second time it ran, it was 65 milliseconds to get the response back. And it didn't need to scan the data at all either. The byte scan stayed uh, basically zero on the second time round. So essentially the second query was free. And I didn't end up using any warehouse in order to do that. Okay, so that's a really sort of nice thing to see. It's nice to see that it's uh, always being optimized to sort of save me money, which is which sort of nice to make sense. Okay, so let's go back to where I was before. Uh, let's go back a couple of steps. And um, I'm just heading back in my browser for the record. The reason you can't see a browser bar is because I think it's easier to see what I'm doing without it. So I've basically turned this into like a web app, essentially, so that we can just go through this without any sort of distraction. Um, so that's that. Um, that's basically that. We've seen the cache working. Let's go on to the next step. In the history window, note that the second query runs significantly faster because the results have been cached. I've shown you this already. And next, let's run this query to see which months are the busiest months. So let's go ahead back into our little uh, SQL script and let's have a look at this uh, SQL here. So select uh, start time. Uh, and as month name. So I think month name is like a function uh, that returns just the name of the month uh, and returns it as month. Notice that it's not month year, so it will just say January, February, March across multiple years of data. So it will aggregate all of these up, count the number of trips in each of those months and do that from the trips table group uh, by one order by two. Uh, descending, okay? So I think essentially group by one, I'm thinking that's like a, uh, like this this function here that just gives us a row number and then order by descending just basically returns the um, the uh, um, in descending order by the number of trips. So if I just, let's just run that query. I'll actually be able to see what it does rather than just talking out of my ass. One second. Yeah, so it does. It does essentially do what I thought it does. So if I just move my face here to the top, you can see here that June is the busiest month, then September, then October. And um, yeah, we basically pretty much get everything that we need and it's it's sort of really nice. Um, to see. Okay, perfect. So that's that. Um, so just another query. Uh, there's no real point here. It's just basically getting us to run a query, which is nice. Um, cloning a table. Now this is nice. Okay. Snowflake allows you to create clones, also known as zero copy clones of tables, schemas and databases in seconds. A snapshot of a data, uh, of data presented. Sorry, let me start again. A snapshot of data present in the source object is taken from the clone uh, from when the clone is created and is made available to the cloned object. Um, in English, basically, it takes a snapshot of the data, but it doesn't actually copy the data. We'll come to that in a second. The cloned object is writable and independent of the clone source. Therefore, changes made to either source object or the clone object are not included in the other, i.e. Let's say I want to test something. I take a snapshot of my real data. It creates a separate clone. And what it does is then from that point onwards, these two clones are independent. So anything I do to my clone doesn't change the real data source, okay? And uh, the next cool thing is a popular use case for zero copy cloning is to clone production environment for use by development and testing to test and experiment without adversely impacting production environment and eliminating the need to set up and manage two separate environments. So a typical thing in analytics is let's say you're building an analytical product, let's say some dashboards. And what you want to do is you want to use real production data in order to do this. But what you don't want to do is to take down your production data. So what you typically have to do is stand up a whole nother environment called dev uh, or development where you basically publish all your data and it's normally a copy from production. So you have to go through the whole process of moving all your data across and that in itself can actually break the production database. I've actually seen this happen a couple of times. Um, and so it's a lot of effort and work. And in, in, in real terms, what you actually end up having is uh, two physical databases, one for dev and one for prod. And there's also a downside, which is dev is never as fast as prod because companies like to cheap out. So what you end up happening is you build an analytical product, never really knowing what the real performance is like because you built it on dev. And then when you get to prod, prod has a whole set of different circumstances that you have to cater for. So all the work you did on dev never actually even mattered. Um, so that's me having a bit of a rant, but anyway, Zero copy cloning is cool. And let's just go into this a bit. A massive benefit of zero copy cloning is that the underlying data is not copied. Only the metadata and pointers of the underlying data change. Hence, they are zero copy. And storage requirements are not double when the data is cloned. Most data warehouses cannot do this, but for Snowflake, this is easy. So what they're saying is you create a clone, but you don't take up twice as much storage. 
because all you're doing is you're copying the metadata around it. So all your query, everything runs on this other metadata layer that's essentially not actually touching your data. So your data always stays too true to form. Everything you've done on top of it is sort of kept separate to the data. And the zero copy clone is sort of an enhanced version of doing that. And you can do that to enable other people to start working on it. Let's say analytical use cases, they're normally quite resource intensive. So they tend to be uh, done on dev environments or separate analytical warehouses. And so this is really nice. Now, the weird thing here is that, you know, Snowflake are confusing the term warehouses. So don't again, confuse warehouses in Snowflake with warehouses in, um, you know, typical databases. So when it talks about most data warehouses cannot do this, Snowflake means a traditional database, database warehouse, not a Snowflake warehouse. Okay. So they're going to show us how to do this. Run the following command in the worksheet to create the development table. So we're just going to go back to our sheet and uh, let's go run that. So create a table, trips, dev clone, trips, hit run, hit run again. This will take a bit of time. Oh, actually it didn't take time because of course it already exists. It's just creating another instance. So table trips dev successfully created. Okay. So in order to see that, let's, let's go ahead. Table trips dev. I think that's in our city bike. So let's go into public and you can see here that uh, trips dev has been created. So if I just sort of highlight this for you, you can see here I now have two databases and they're essentially the same. I could run one query on one and another query on the other and they're exactly the same, but now these two are separated. I can't, I can't break trips just because I'm working on trips dev, but the underlying data is exactly the same. I didn't need to load all my data from S3 again to get this one to work, right? It's everything has just sort of been kept nicely separate. Okay. So that's really cool. Um, I really like that. It's nice sort of nice to have. Um, and if I just go back to my, uh, actually don't do that. Let's go to my worksheets. Um, don't know why I hit back there. We're actually on this step and we've already completed that. So that's good. Um, essentially we just wanted to see where trips dev was and we've, we've seen that already. So that's a nice thing. That's a nice thing to have. Um, but again, just to sort of summarize this section, analytical queries, results, cache, cloning, these are just standard database capabilities. Um, if you work with a database, this stuff is bread and butter. But actually some of the benefits of Snowflake is it breaks that down in a way that's sort of really, really cool. And I think it's really interesting. Okay. Next, number seven. So we're moving on here. You can see at the top, it says 46 remaining. I like the sort of time estimate. I doubt we'll keep to that because I'm talking whilst doing this. So if I did that, it might end up being like a three hour video or something. But anyway, let's keep going. Working with semi-structured data uh, views and join, okay? So uh, going back to the labs example, the City Bikes Analytics team wants to determine how weather impacts ride counts. To do this in this section, we will load data in JSON format uh, here, held in a public S3 bucket. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, create a view and query the semi-structured data using SQL not, uh, dot notation. Run a query that joins the JSON data to the previously loaded trips data. Analyze the weather and ride count data to determine their relationship. Okay, so. This is really interesting because JSON is a slightly different data format. Okay, it's not a sort of a traditional data source like a CSV. Um, it's it's typically more used in web development. So I think it stands for JavaScript Object Notation, which is um, uh, just another sort of I, I don't know why they come up with all these names, but JavaScript Object Notation is essentially a way that you write JavaScript to talk about sort of information in a hierarchy. It typically uses information stored in in, in arrays and different levels of hierarchy with arrays. In, in those hierarchies, uh, but I'm not a web programmer, so I could also just be, you know, maligning that description. So if I am, let me know in the description, we'll get stuck in, okay? Um, so this is actually quite a cool step because we quite often have to work with data sources from the web. And I know in Tableau, you can connect to JSON files directly, so you kind of don't have to worry about that. But what's even better is actually not having to burden Tableau with the sort of processing that it's going to have to do to process that JSON and just connecting to it directly through Snowflake. And so Snowflake can do the hard work of reading that uh, data and then you can just natively query columns and rows exactly like you would in any other database and let uh, let Snowflake do all the hard work of sort of understanding that that data. So it's a nice little sort of feature and I think it's it's a really sort of nice um, nice thing to do. So let's let's figure out how it works. So 
Um, let's read this yellow section. Semi-structured data. Uh, Snowflake can easily load and query semi-structured data, such as JSON, Parquet, or Avro, without transformation. So you don't need to do any transformation work to get this to work. This is important because an increasing amount of business-relevant data being generated a day is semi-structured, and many traditional data warehouses cannot easily load and query such data. Snowflake makes it easy. So the point here is, typically, if you were having to work with this data, you'd have to run a step before you loaded it into your database then you can start to work with it the problem there is it adds time cost and also expertise because you've got to have people who know what they're doing to write the scripts and the transformations required to do that now for some people that might not be a big uh, step but if lots of your data comes from web data sources then this is literally going to be uh, like, a, like a whole team doing this and making sure this works every time so to do this demo, we need to create a new table. So we'll go back to our, um, our our worksheet and we'll just start sort of using some of these. So create a database. We're going to create some roles um, to look at this data. And then next, uh, let's create a table called JSON Weather. Uh, we're basically just going to go work our way through this and bring in data from various places. Uh, so this is a fun exercise. It will take a bit of time, but let's get into it. I think we should be able to get to, to the end of this um, very easily. So let's go ahead and do this. So. Uh, if I go back in here and we just into model six, so let's go ahead and create a database called weather. And if we do that and hit run, um, uh, it's actually going to say database weather has been created. I'm just going to refresh this left hand side and you should see here weather is turned up. So uh, this one here is just uh, the one we want. And what we can do is we can just uh, sort of expand this and just see that there's nothing there. So there's no uh, tables or anything in our public sort of area in, in, in this particular view. So that's good. Uh, then we have some roles to create. So use role sysadmin, which is already what I am. Use warehouse, compute warehouse, already where I am. Use database weather, already where I am. And use schema public, already where I am. Now notice. Um, in the previous step, we were running everything on city uh, bikes. And so when I actually created this database, I reckon it automatically, I'm not I'm not 100% sure, but I think it automatically took me to that database because um, if you create a database, likelihood is the thing you want to do next is to work in it. So instead of having you have to remember each time to switch databases, it just switched you over, which is sort of a nice thing. It just keeps, stops you sort of working. But if you're working in your own tool, don't create a database and then uh, start running the wrong queries on the wrong database. That's a, that's a bit of a howler, okay? So now uh, once we've created our database, we can go ahead and create this table. So JSON, weather, data, and vvariant. Let's just go back and see what it says about that. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, let's create a table called JSON weather that will be used for loading JSON. In the works, you can run the SQL text below. Snowflake has a special column type called variant which will allow us to store the entire JSON object and eventually query it directly. So that's why this uh, this this V variant uh, thing has been in inserted. I don't know what the initial V is for. Um, again, if you know, let me know in the comments, but um, variant uh, makes sense. They've actually told us what that is. So essentially, if we're working with JSON data, we need to tell Snowflake that's what it is, okay? Um, semi-structured data magic. The variant data type allows Snowflake to ingest semi-structured data without having to predefine the schema. This is very cool. So remember before when we worked on city bikes, we had to sort of uh, convey the schema because we had to tell it that, look, this column is a string, this column is a number, this column is called this, this column is called that. JSON has that sort of hierarchy built in. So essentially what it's saying is that the variant um, sort of notation allows them to just go in and not have to specify a schema. The reason this is, is because when you use JavaScript object notation, essentially you can have an endless number of hierarchies inside of that sort of data array. So if you had to describe the schema, you'd always be limiting yourself because if you add like say a new feature in a web application, you might add a new hierarchy in your JSON object uh, to, to reflect the data that comes from that new feature. And so if you don't have to do that, the schema can always be adapting itself to suit your needs. And so not having to specify schema is, is really, really, really handy. Okay. So, um, that makes a lot of sense. So let's go back and I just wasn't sure what the variant was. So let's go ahead and create table and run. So uh, now that's just done, uh, what we should be able to see, if I just go back into uh, public and just refresh this again, and not in my views, go to public. You can see here that tables um, is there. So JSON weather data has been created and that's what we, we were working with. So we're still in weather uh, and that's all been nicely created, okay? 
So now that we've done that, uh, let's have a look and see what's next. So verify that the table JSON has been created. We've seen it already. We've gone to database. So now we can load data into it. So we've checked all this already. So we can now start loading data. So via the worksheet, create a stage where the unstructured data is stored in AWS S3. So again, like last time, we need to go tell uh, Snowflake where the data is. This time around, notice we're doing it entirely inside of the um, worksheet. We're doing it inside of the qu query editor. So um, this is something you can do. I could go into the databases, collect, create a stage and everything, but you can actually do it all through the command line. So, you know, what tends to happen is the more and more you work with these tools, the more and more you just do all your work in one place, because having done it in that one place, you can then just make sure um, that everything is sort of done properly. And like we saw before, it's actually probably a better way to do it, because then you can make sure you've covered all your bases when it comes to writing the SQL you need to write. So let's go ahead and run this and let's see what happens. So create stage, New York weather, URL is that. And that's pretty much it. So hit run. Stage error, New York weather successfully created. We can go validate that a little bit by going to databases. We can go to weather and then we go to the stages tab and we should see the stage there, New York weather. So that's been created for us. It's really nice to see that. Let's go back to the worksheet and we're pretty much uh, good to go. Now, when we say list at New York weather, what we're basically going to see is what files are inside of that S3 bucket. So let's go ahead and hit that. And what we should see is all the different sort of weather files. They're dumped there as JSON files. So essentially the weather is being sort of collected at various intervals. And every day, I assume it's just sort of dumping uh, the weather for that particular day. So it's also sort of, sort of in different parts. I'm not sure exactly what weather is in which file, but you can see here that it's it's just dumping in there. And the second thing is it's compressed. So it's a gzip uh, file again, and that's something to be aware of, okay? So once it's there, I don't think we have to do anything because you can just see here the next step is to copy that JSON weather data from our New York weather staging area to the uh, new place, which is JSON weather. So uh, this is sort of written backwards. So what we're basically saying is uh, copy all our data from New York weather into the JSON weather data and the file format is type JSON. <laughs> so it's a bit like uh, Yoda in, in, in Star Wars. He always sort of talks from the middle of the sentence to the front and then to the back, you know, wise one is, and you could just say you're a wise one, okay? So this is sort of like JSON, uh, this is sort of SQL for you. Um, I don't know why it's like this. Um, this is programmers years ago who, you know, um, just wanted to make things um, maybe more cumbersome. Who knows, maybe there's a good reason. Uh, if you know, let me know. So let's go ahead and run this query, copy into JSON weather data from New York weather, file format equals type J equals JSON, hit run. And now once we've done that, um, you can see I'm fairly confident here. I know what's going to happen. So I'm not even bothering to go back to the guide because, you know, you can start to sort of guess what's going to happen each time. And you can see that it loaded each and every one of these pretty well. We got a loaded uh, status for each one. So that works. We're pretty uh, happy with that. And now what we can do now we've loaded the data, we can just go ahead and look at the first 10 rows of data from our new database. So let's go ahead and hit run. And when you do that, you'll see that this is real JSON data. So we get the city. Let me just bring this up so we can see more of it. So we only get 10 rows, but you can see here that if I just if I just click on uh, one of the lines, it gives me a little preview. And so you can see here we get the city, the coordinates, the lat and long. And so you can sort of see the hierarchy I was talking about. So uh, there's this object called city. And then in that hierarchy, it goes one step and each city has a coordinate and uh, each coordinate has two attributes, a latitude and a longitude. And that's all part of the city. Uh, label. Okay. Then you've got country. Uh, uh, actually, I'm wrong. Uh, coordinate is one thing. Country is another thing. Uh, the name is another thing. The ID is another thing. The languages, the different ways you can say it is, is another thing. So this is a really sort of complex hierarchy. And essentially, I think this is just the weather in that particular city at that particular time. I don't, I think if I keep scrolling down, it's actually loading more data, which is why what's going on. So when I get to row 226, um, I think that's actually the bottom of the data set this time. Uh, I don't think there's other, I think there is more. 226 is the last row. So you can see there's quite a lot of data and you've got different timestamps and different sort of um, weather. But uh, I think this is just, here's the specific time, here's the weather, and this is the description basically. 
Okay, so that's how this data looks like. And then you've got this multiple times each and every time. So essentially, this is New York weather uh, again and again and again. Uh, and it's got different locations in New York. It's not just the one location. You can see here we've got different latitudes and longitudes. They're ever so slightly different. Uh, maybe they're coming from set weather stations and that's what they're using essentially to uh, take the weather in New York. Because New York is a big place, but if you're just talking about the city of New York, well, there's probably only going to be three or four weather stations you can realistically used to get a real-time weather reading uh, from the city um, as, as a data source. So that makes a lot of sense. So that's essentially it. We've seen, we've loaded our JSON. We're pretty much ready to go. Now, if I go back to the guide, it's going to talk a little bit about um, working with views. So we've done all of this step. If you're wondering why I'm skipping past this, we've actually done all of this. I didn't necessarily do it here. I just talked through it. Okay. Next thing, let's look at how Snowflake allows us to create a view and also query the JSON data directly using SQL. Okay, so views and materialized views. A view allows the result of a query to be accessed as if it were a table. Uh, views can help present data to end users in a cleaner manner, limit what end users can view in a source table and write more modular SQL. There are also materialized views in which SQL results are stored as though the results were a table. This allows faster access but requires storage space. Materialized views can be accessed with Snowflake's Enterprise Edition or higher. Okay, So you need to be able to use a certain sort of um, a set of databases. Now, this is sort of interesting because I'm actually on a paid version of Snowflake, so I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, materialized views can be accessed with an enterprise edition or higher. I'm not an enterprise edition. I'm just on a standard edition, but I know the demo would probably have enabled this. So if this doesn't work, this is probably why. So let's go ahead and try and run this anyway. We should some get some little warning that sort of makes some sense. So let's see if we can create the view anyway and just hit run. OK, so here we are with the SQL. Uh, we've got all the information there. Let's hit run. Uh, so yeah, the view was successfully created. Um, let's just uh, refresh this little right hand side area. And you can see here that I now have a new view just over here. So we have tables and then we have views. Don't forget, views are like tables, but they're not the same, okay? Uh, they're sort of based on tables. It's like it's like you're basically uh, creating a perspective of the real thing. So you, you want something to be simpler for someone to work with. So what you go and do is you'd go and do all the work in advance. And when you materialize that view, essentially that work doesn't have to be done every single time. It's already been done once, and that can be the sort of starting point. But what you're not doing is changing your source data in order to do that. Um, so that's why sort of views are, are useful in this particular instance. So that's really nice. Um, SQL.notation v.city.core.lat is used in this command to pull out values at lower levels within the JSON hierarchy. This allows us to treat each field as if it were a column in a relational table. So in the previous uh, step, what we'd actually seen is that each city has a bunch of information, things like coordinates, things like uh, the location, the Latin long, the uh, different ways it can be spelt, for example, or different ways it can be used in language. And what we're doing with the dot notation here is we're just going deeper and deeper into the hierarchy. So again, you can go uh, deeper into a JSON hierarchy as you add more complexity to your hierarchy. And that's essentially what's going on here. So. You can see here V city is essentially the name of the city. And then we go dot ID and then we bring it back um, the city ID as a as city ID essentially. It's an integer, which is why it says int. Uh, the next one is V city, so city dot name. And again, we just bring it back as a string as city name. Uh, let's go something a little bit harder. So V dot city, then dot coordinates dot lat. That basically brings us back the latitude, okay? And then as you go down, you can see that there's, there's obviously sort of different levels of this hierarchy that you can go and get. So it's a really nice, simple way of sort of getting to data in a hierarchy without having to know too much about the whole entire structure of the whole thing or having a column for everything sort of predefined in a schema in advance. So that's a really nice thing to do. Um, and what they've done is they've actually sort of filtered it a little bit. So uh, from Jason Weather, where city ID equals this. So this, I think, is the city ID for New York. So that's why that's there. It's sort of filtering the data. Um, we're getting it from Jason Weather, but we're making sure the city ID is 5128638, which I believe would be the same ID as uh, New York. So if I click on this, I can actually go ahead and preview the data. 
And um, so what I did there, in case you missed that, just for reference, is I went down here, I clicked on JSON weather, that created this little preview so I could see all the data types coming from this uh, thing. And then I clicked on preview data and that preview data then gave me this table, okay? So that's, that's sort of how it works and that's how it all came together, okay? So yeah, you can see here, this is all New York, 5128638. That's essentially just like me running a filter in Tableau essentially, and now that's super, super easy to work with, okay? So that's that's it. That's basically this particular step. We've got a couple more steps. Um, let's see if we can sort of figure out the next step without reading the instructions. So select star from JSON weather data, select everything from JSON weather data, where the date is the same as 2018, uh, January the 1st, 2018 essentially, and just return the first uh, 20 rows, okay? So let's just run that to make sure that is actually what's going on. Let's hit run and we should see that everything is from, yes, uh, the, oh, interesting. So hold on, hold on a second. So let's, what happened here? So date truncates the month, of course. Um, and observa observation time is, okay. So it's basically taking everything in 2018 uh, January and whether it's um, you know whether it's on the 17th of Jan or the 1st of Jan it's all going to return the basically the the day of the first of the month because we're truncating to the month so if I give you a date and a time let's say the 2nd of January um, uh, 2018 on uh, you know whatever what what time let's choose a time like 2 a.m in the morning when you truncate that down to the month it gets rid of everything up until month and it just returns that but it gives it a time Stamp still of midnight so that's why you'll get um sort of the 17th and the 9th because they're all coming back as that and um what we can see here is um we're not actually giving the column name as well we're not doing it as that so just just be careful that this is this is like running a filter essentially okay and we're limiting it to the first 20 rows and we're basically just returning everything so if we go back to the guide let's kind of see what logic they were trying to get us to do here so uh, if we go back here, view the worksheet, verify the view uh, with the following query. Notice the results look like a regular structured data source. Your result uh, set may have different observation time values. Okay, so that's basically it. They just wanted us to see that, look, you've loaded data from a, a semi-structured data source. So that's very easy to run. Okay, now, then we start to do things that are a little bit more complex. Um, now we're going to start working with joins. So um, here you can see uh, use a join operation to correlate against data set. So we will now join the JSON weather data to our citybike.public.trips data to understand, uh, so to answer our original question of how weather impacts the number of rides. So run the command below to join weather to trips and count the number of trips associated with certain weather conditions. So essentially what they want us to do is start doing something you do in the real world. Let's match up this weather data to this trip state and see if there's a correlation. So that is going to require a little bit of um, sort of bringing data together, but also a little bit of math because essentially we need to sort of create some sort of correlation and see if the two are related. So here you can just look at the query, select weather as conditions, uh, count the number of trips from city bike public trips, and then bring that uh, data together left at a join to the JSON weather data view um, on date trunk our observation time equal date trunk our start time so basically it's saying compare the weather observation time to the hour to the date truncation uh, hour start time so compare the uh, observation time to the start time of the journey and where the condition is not null where basically there is no weather data and group by one order by two de uh, descending okay so let's go to the query and just look at that so let's there it is again um, it's pretty straightforward or I hope it's straightforward if not I'll go over it once it's run so we can see it more clearly so let's hit run and what we should see is you should see here the conditions on the left and here are the number of trips on the right. So it's just basically doing a, a, a general sort of uh, tick for each condition, go and do this. So if we just actually look at the SQL again, I think now we, we're in a better place to um, understand it. So um, select weather as conditions. So that's why we have conditions on the left. And then count the number of trips from the city by public trips. Hence we have this on the right hand side. Okay. Left out to join JSON weather data on date trunk uh, observation time equals that. So it's basically just then defining the relationship between the two things where condition is not null and then group by order by, by two. So um, essentially what it's doing is you're defining the way these two data sets come together here. 
and you're basically choosing what you're going to see here at the top and then you're choosing how it's ordered over here essentially okay so that's pretty cool that's uh nice to see uh, it's nice to see that that works and that i think is the very last step of this particular exercise so that was seven working with semi-structured data views and joining essentially doing analytical queries and making sure that all works uh, really really well okay Okay, so that's pretty much it. We're going to stop this here. In the next video, what we're going to do is look at time travel and try and figure out uh, how that works. It's a really cool feature. It basically lets you undo things. And you can see here that I've actually been already looking at it, just checking it out. But it lets you undo things, basically go back in time. Uh, if you're on the standard edition, it goes back uh, up to 24 hours. If you're on the enterprise edition, up to 90 days of history, you can essentially run a query as if you were doing it back in time and essentially get the results from that point in time and not where you are today. It also allows you to rescue yourself should you delete something or do something that uh, you sort of shouldn't do. So we'll check this out in the next video. And um, this has been sort of 40, 45 minutes. So um, I think this is about the right time. I, if I carry on for a, another bit longer, we'll probably end up being an hour and a half. And that's probably too long for a video. So uh, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video. If you've enjoyed this, let me know what you think in the comments below. And we'll catch you in the next video. Take it easy.